They say don't go out at night. They say don't stay up past your bedtime. They say a lot of things, and they do it to teach you good habits, but what they don't realize is that they're actually saving you from something far worse. The fact of the matter is that he will come for you if you don't listen. I mean, if you really don't listen. Not just staying up too late, forgetting to brush your teeth, lying to your parents. No. He won't come after you for something silly like that. You'll know when he's there, because you'll know you've done it. And you will feel his warm breath fill the room as you lay in bed, motionless in the dead of night. You know that creak you just heard out in the hallway? And you ignored it because it's just the noises in your house? It was him slipping into your room, right under your nose. He's in your room right now, watching you quiver with fear. In fact, he's salivating at the sight of your panicked little face. He can see each and every sweat bead drip down your cheek onto your dampened pillow, or... Are those tears? No. Not yet. Your cheeks aren't red enough for that to be tears yet. See, he would know if you were crying. He would take you before the dear... He would take you before the teardrop could even form. He won't allow you to feel sorry for what you've done. There it is again. Trying to convince yourself it's just the pipes, the AC kicking back on, but you know it's still him. And now he's standing over your bedside watching you cower. You think he would have taken you by now. It's been oh so long that there's no way that he's here. But you'd be wrong. He steps closer the more you sweat, the more you stress, the more you worry, the stronger he gets. See, he feeds off your anxiety. He hears your hurried breathing and his heart starts racing. He stands there waiting for the perfect moment when the fear he's induced upon you has reached its peak and you are absolutely pissed, terrified. He will take his time until he slowly creeps up to the foot of your bed, crouching down onto all fours like a canine, placing his long, bony hands at the end of your bed and letting his eyes wander as he takes in the moment with a long sniff. As you're paralyzed with fear, it makes you wonder if that was your cat or his warm, clammy hands brushing the bottoms of your feet. He's watching. He loves it when you try to hide your fear, even though you know he can fucking smell it. You keep trying to look down without him noticing so you can see what's down there, but all you really want to know is what it is that's tickling your toes and nibbling at your heels. But you can't. The possibility of it being him horrifies you, and he loves that. He lets out a quivering, deep breath that shakes the bed, almost a sigh of pleasure to let you know that he's there, flaunting that he knows you know. And he's still going to get you. But you stay solid, don't you? But don't you realize what's happening? What's going to happen? Why aren't you running? Why aren't you kicking, screaming, anything? Because deep down, you know why he's here, and you know you can't escape. He knows he has you now. He's slowly but surely slithered his way up and under your sheets and nestled his bony, bony hands between your thighs. He's soaking up all that moisture because by now you've definitely pissed yourself. And he's loving every second of it. He's letting out deep, ghoulish moans so loud that your mother would probably hear them if she were awake. But deep down you know she's already gone. He always saves the children for last. You hold your breath as you feel his weight move over the top of you, directly over you. And if the lights were on, you'd be looking him directly in the eyes. With what you would assume to be your last breath, you let out a weak attempt at fixing what you've done. I'm sorry. As your final breath dissipates into the air, your last tear dribbles down your cheek onto his long, sticky fingers. And you feel the room start to rumble. Everything begins shaking, the lights flicker on and off, and it allows you to catch this short glimpse of a spine-chilling face. His dark, dead eyes stab deeply into you like knives as a sinister smile stretches across the unearthly surface where his facial features lie. His mouth is dripping, salivating with hot and sticky saliva leaking directly onto your fear-stricken face. 
You try to let out a scream, but that will be the last mistake you ever make because you feel the long twig-like thumb snake down your throat as he grips your face with both hands, almost laughing with pleasure when finally, finally the lights turn on and his eyes come to life with a bright reddish-orange glow. You try to scream again. You swing your arms back and forth and up and down, but you know it's no use. And as you cling to your last breath, you try letting out one of those last apologies, last goodbyes. But he cuts you off and leans in real close to your face. Your noses are almost touching. The saliva is dripping all over you. And you can feel his damp, hot breath wafting into your mouth. He whispers very quietly into your ear in a low, guttural, churning voice. I am very And just like that, just like so many other misbehaved boys and girls before you, you will never be seen again. It's sad, really. Once a good child with a happy life and a loving family, now all that'll be left in your place is a damp puddle of sweat and tears and the regret that you should be feeling if you could. You should have just stayed on course. You should have just behaved. As I said, he won't come after you for a white lie, but they will raise his attention towards you. And each one is an open invitation. He's forgiving. He understands mistakes. But you never learned, did you? You just kept pushing. And now you've left your mother wondering what she did to deserve this, and the answer is you. That's when you enter his line of prey. If you would have just asked to go to your friend's house, to drink the whiskey like the big man you are, then she'd be alive. You don't realize how lenient your mother was because she never got the chance to show you. But you were too scared of her saying no. What's so hard about listening? Go ahead, cry, scream. Nobody's alive to hear you do it. You've killed the only people who care about you. If you would have been a normal fucking kid, she would still be alive, your father would still be alive, and you wouldn't have to spend the rest of eternity in this endlessly torturous hellhole. But you didn't even bother. And now, now the boogeyman has come. The boogeyman has come, and the days of running so fast your nose runs with your best buddy from third grade, James Henderson, they've come to an end. See, the boogeyman knows that when you were 12, you pushed James off the slide, and even though it was really an accident, the sound of his cries and the teacher yelling, they didn't go unnoticed. Franklin was a normal kid in all the ways that one could describe a 15-year-old in today's America. The gross overplay of tragedy and gory stories on late-night news, which, while pacifying the general public, it opens the children's minds into things that they would likely not have to worry about until their first election. That being said, Franklin had no signs of mental illness or anything of the sort. He was normal. That's what makes last week's events so tragic and so surprising. That is, surprising to those who see the world through their paper straws. But to those with open eyes and clear minds, there is a world among us that is totally beyond us, yet is constantly intermingling within every moment of everyday life. Franklin may have been a decent kid, but the boogeyman doesn't give a shit for the well-behaved, nor does he give a shit about the poorly behaved. He preys on those riding the middle line, unsure of how they feel about just everything. The impressionable ones, who frankly, would be talked about on late night news for 30 minutes, never to be thought of again. These things are real, and if you don't have your senses in order, you are incapable of seeing clearly. Wendigos, werewolves... They are all more salivating as they follow you close. The day before the day in question, he woke up with a pit in his stomach, Frankie. He had a horrific dream that he was being chased by some... Well, there's no accurate words that could describe the thing stalking him. Frankie was no wimp. His father was a career construction worker. He grew up tough on nightmares, so, well, they usually didn't shake him like this one had. Only the problem festering in the back of Frankie's head wasn't the nightmare at all. It was the same feeling that he felt in the dream lingering into his waking life. He felt like something was watching him. The human body is equipped with what are basically five reality sensors. Realistically, there's a higher number of micro senses, but the main five responsible for allowing you to accurately interpret the world around you, they're your sight, hearing, touch, and scent. And you, you know the drill. You're adeptly capable of conceptualizing reality. However, these things that live just outside of our world on the edge of reality and fairy tale, 
They have an array of senses that each of which is stronger and more finely attuned than any of our five. Franklin felt what he could interpret as being watched, and the boogeyman was watching him. But what Frankie was really recognizing with his senses, it was the only way of his body conceptualizing the boogeyman's vice grip around the child's soul. When children sleep, they're not just vulnerable, they're like idling cars on a street in Southside Chicago, begging to be taken. Mr. Boogeyman is closing in on Franklin, and he has been for a while. And just now, Frankie is noticing the signs. Just now, when the long bony hands of the Boogeyman wrap around your soul. Frankie went to school with a keen eye, constantly darting his eyes back and forth to make sure nothing was running amok along the tree line or in the car behind him on the bus ride to school. At one point, Frankie thought to himself, <laughs> imagine the fucking boogeyman chasing me in a car, shaking his fist like an old grandma who just got cut off. The day at school was normal, but it was anxiety-inducing. Normal was beginning to be a foreign idea to Frank, and he sat on the bus back home reflecting on how he should have flirted with Jessica and all the other little regrets of the day that we all had at one point, when he realized something. All of his teachers were acting really strange, not in terms of what they were doing, but in terms of what the topics in class were about. They were all centralized around this this thing called like a baphomet. He realized this as he sounded it out on Google. Apparently it's some satanic thing tied to another school shooting today, is what the headline read. It was when Frankie got home that we must pay close attention, though. The events that unfold in the next 12 hours would prove extreme for Frankie. Walking through his back door as he does every day around 5.25 after basketball practice, he smelled something, a uh, particularly smelly smell. He enters through a side door that brings him into his garage, and in the garage was a pile of newspapers that was about the diameter of an average sedan, with some of the clippings dating back to the 70s, and of course, there were current ones there too, but as Frankie shuffled through them, he discovered the origin of the scent. In fact, there was a pile of shit, cow shit to be specific, lying underneath the pile of stories. But they weren't just any stories. They were articles about school shootings. His mother had made dinner at this point, and his dad was dead asleep on the couch. Mom, what's going on in the garage? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, honey. Thinking that it was most likely some cow that wandered into the garage without anyone noticing and laying down some fucking cow dung, and your father jerry-rigged a solution by putting newspaper over it. It's not an impossibility in this area. He eats his dinner, makes some appropriately timed poop jokes, and at one point his father was no longer on the couch, and he was relieved that he could get the scent of poop off his nose with some nice Alfredo. However, he still felt that something was watching him. No matter what he did all day, he couldn't shake that feeling. And when he laid his head down to sleep at night, just before he closed his eyes, he caught a whiff of rancid hot breath drifting slowly past his face. The headline the next day read, 15 lives lost in the country's 29th school shooting in 23 days. Let me tell you something. The boogeyman does not like to waste his energy. But he will come for you, and in Frankie's case, he has. And you will feel his presence. <laughs>